Chapter Ten of The Pleasures of Ignorance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind. Ten. Why we hate insects. It has been said that the characteristic sound of summer is the hum of insects as the characteristic sound of spring is the singing of birds it is all the more curious that the word insect conveys to us an implication of ugliness we think of spiders of which many people are more afraid than of germans we think of bugs and fleas which seem so indecent in their lives that they are made a jest by the vulgar and the nice people do their best to avoid mentioning them we think of black beetles scurrying into safety as the kitchen light is suddenly turned on black beetles which so we are told in the first place are not beetles and in the second place are not black there are some women who will make a face at the mere name of any of these creatures those of us who have never felt this repulsion at least against spiders and black beetles cannot but wonder how far it is natural is it born in certain people or is it acquired like the old-fashioned habit of swooning in the fear of mice the nearest I have come to it is a feeling of disgust when I have seen a cat retrieving a black beetle just about to escape under a wall and making a dish of it. There are also certain crawling creatures, which are so notoriously the children of Phil and so threatening in their touch that we naturally shrink from them. Burns may make merry over a louse crawling in a lady's hair, but few of us can regard his kind with equanimity, even on the backs of swine men of science deny that the louse is actually engendered by dirt but it undoubtedly thrives on it our anger against the flea also arises from the fact that we associate it with dirt dunn once wrote a poem to a lady who had been bitten by the same flea as himself arguing that this was a good reason why she should allow him to make love to her it is and was bound to be a dirty poem love even of the wandering and polygynous kind does not express itself in such images only while under the dominion of the youthful heresy of ugliness could a poet pretend that it did the flea according to the authorities is remarkable for its powers of leaping and nearly cosmopolitan even so it has found no place in the heart or fancy of man there have been men who are indifferent to fleas but there have been none who loved them though if my memory does not betray me there was a famous french prisoner some years ago who beguiled the tedium of his cell by making a pet and a performer of a flea for the world at large the flea represents merely hateful irritation mr w b yeats has introduced it into poetry in this sense in an epigram addressed to a poet who would have me praise certain bad poets imitators of his and of mine you say as i have often given tongue in praise of what another's said or sung twere politic to do the like by these but where's the wild dog that has praised his fleas when we think of the suffering of human beings and animals at the hands if that is the right word of insects we feel that it is pardonable enough to make faces at creatures so inconsiderate but what strikes me as remarkable is that the insects that do man most harm are not those that horrify him most a lady who will sit bravely while a wasp hangs in the air and inspects first her right and then her left temple will run a mile from a harmless spider another will remain collected though murderous in presence of a horsefly but will shudder at sight of a moth that is innocent of blood our fears it is evident do not march in all respects with our sense of physical danger there are insects that make us feel that we are in presence of the uncanny many of us have this feeling about moths moths are the ghosts of the insect world it may be the manner in which they flutter in unheralded out of the night which terrifies us they seem to tap against our lighted windows as though the outer darkness had a message for us and their persistence helps to terrify they are more troublesome than a subject nation they are more importunate than the importunate widow but they are most terrifying of all if one suddenly sees their eyes blazing crimson as they catch the light one thinks of nocturnal rites in an african forest temple and of terrible jewels blazing in the head of an evil goddess jewels to be stolen we realize by a foolish white man 
thereafter to be the object of a vendetta in a sensational novel. One feels that one's hair would be justified in standing on end, only that hair does not do such things. The sight of a moth's eye is, I fancy, a rare one for most people. It is a sight one can no more forget than a house on fire. Our feelings toward moths being what they are, it is all the more surprising that superstition should connect the moth so much less than the butterfly with the world of the dead. Who, save a cabbage grower, has any feeling against butterflies? And yet, in folklore, it is to the butterfly rather than to the moth that is assigned the ghostly part. In Ireland they have a legend about a priest who would not believe that men had souls, but, on being converted, announced that a living thing would be seen soaring up from his body when he died, in proof that his earlier skepticism had been wrong. Sure enough, when he lay dead, a beautiful creature with four snow-white wings rose from his body and fluttered around his head. And this, we are told, was the first butterfly that was ever seen in Ireland, and now all men know that the butterflies are the souls of the dead, waiting for the moment when they may enter purgatory. In the Solomon Islands, they say, it used to be the custom, when a man was about to die, for him to announce that he was about to transmigrate into a butterfly or some other creature. The members of his family, on meeting a butterfly afterwards, would exclaim, This is Papa, and offer him a coconut. The members of an English family, in like circumstances, would probably say, Have a banana. In certain tribes of Assam, the dead are believed to return in the shape of butterflies or houseflies, and for this reason no one will kill them. On the other hand, in Westphalia, the butterfly plays the part given to the scapegoat in other countries, and on St. Peter's Day in February, it is publicly expelled with rhyme and ritual. Elsewhere, as in Samoa, I do not know where I found all these facts, probably in the Golden Bough, the butterfly has been feared as a god, and to catch a butterfly was to run the risk of being struck dead. The moth, for all I know, may be the center of as many legends, but I have not met them. It may be, however, that in many of the legends the moth and the butterfly are not very clearly distinguished. To most of us it seems easy enough to distinguish between them. The English butterfly can always be known, for instance, by his clubbed horns. But this distinction does not hold with regard to the entire world of butterflies, a world so populous and varied that 13,000 species have already been discovered and entomologists hope one day to classify twice as many more. Even in these islands, indeed, most of us do not judge a moth chiefly by its lack of clubbed horns. It is for us the thing that flies by night and eats holes in our clothes. We are not even afraid of it in all circumstances. Our terror is an indoors terror. We are on good terms with it in poetry, and play with the thought of the desire of the moth for the star. We remember that it is for the moths that the pallid jasmine smells so sweetly by night. There is no shudder in our minds when we read, And when white moths were on the wing, and moth-like stars were flickering out, I dropped the berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout. No man has ever sung of spiders or earwigs or any other of our pet antipathies among the insects like that. The moth is the only one of the insects that fascinates us with both its beauty and its terror. I doubt if there have been greater hordes of insects in this country than during the past spring. It is the only complaint one has to make against the sun. He is a desperate breeder of insects, and he breeds them not in families like a Christian, but in plagues. The thought of the insects alone keeps us from envying the tropics their blue skies and hot suns better than North Pole than a plague of locusts. We fear the tarantula and have no love for the tsetse fly. The insects of our own climate are bad enough in all conscience. The grasshopper, they say, is our murderer, and though the earwig is a perfect mother, other insects, such as the burying beetle, have the reputation of parasites. But, dangerous or not, the insects are for the most part teasers and destroyers. The green fly makes its colonies in the rose. A purple fellow swarms under the leaves of the apples, and another scoundrel, black as the night, swarms over the beans. There are scarcely more diseases in the human body than there are kinds of insects in a single fruit tree. The apple that is rotten before it is ripe is an insect's victim, 
and if the plums fall green and untimely in scores upon the ground once more it is an insect that has been at work among them talk about german spies had german spies gone to the insect world for a lesson they might not have been the inefficient bunglers that they showed themselves to be at the same time most of us hate spies and insects for the same reason we regard them as noxious creatures intruding where they have no right to be preying upon us and giving us nothing but evil in return hence our ruthlessness we say vermin and destroy them to regard a human being as an insect is always the first step in treating him without remorse it is a perilous attitude and in general is more likely to beget crime than justice there is never i believe been an empire built in which at some stage or other a massacre of children among a revolting population has not been excused on the ground that nits make lice swat that bolshevik no doubt seems to many reactionaries as sanitary a council as swat that fly even in regard to flies however most of us can only swat with scruple hate flies as we may and wish them in perdition as we may we could not slowly pull them to pieces wing after wing and leg after leg as thoughtless children are said to do many of us cannot endure to see them slowly done to death on those long strips of sticky paper on which flies drag their legs and their lives out as it seems to me a vile cruelty a distinguished novelist has said that to watch flies trying to tug their legs off the paper one after another till they are twice their natural length is one of his favorite amusements i have never found any difficulty in believing it of him it is an odd fact that considerateness if not actually kindness to flies has been made one of the tests of gentleness in our popular speech how often has one heard it said in praise of a dead man he wouldn't have hurt a fly as for those who do hurt flies we pillory them in history we have never forgotten the cruelty of domitian at the beginning of his reign suetonius tells us he used to spend hours in seclusion every day doing nothing but catch flies and stab them with a keenly sharpened stylus consequently when someone asked if anyone was in there with caesar vibius crispus made the witty reply not even a fly and just as most of us are on the side of the fly against omission so are most of us on the side of the fly against the spider we pity the fly as if the image is permissible the underdog one of the most agonizing of the minor dilemmas in which a too sensitive humanitarian ever finds himself is whether he should destroy a spider's web and so perhaps starve the spider to death or whether he should leave the web and so connive at the death of a multitude of flies i have long been content to leave nature to her own ways in such matters i cannot say that i like her in all her processes but i am content to believe that this may be owing to my ignorance of some of the facts of the case there are on the other hand two acts of destruction in nature which leave me unprotesting and pleased one of these occurs when a thrush eats a snail banging the shell repeatedly against a stone i have never thought of the incident from the snail's point of view i find myself listening to the tap tap of the shell on the stone as though it were music i felt the same sort of mild thrill of pleasure the other day when i found a beautiful spotted ladybird squeezing itself between two apples and settling down to feed on some kind of aphids that were eating into the fruit the ladybird the butterfly and the bee who would put chains on such creatures these are insects that must have been in eden before the snake beelzebub the god of the other insects had not yet any engendering power on the earth in those days when all the flowers were as strange as insects and all the insects were as beautiful as flowers end of chapter ten chapter eleven of the pleasures of ignorance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen the pleasures of ignorance by robert lind chapter eleven virtue there is a grave danger of a revival of virtue in this country there are i know two kinds of virtue and only one of them is a vice unfortunately it is the latter a revival of which is threatened to-day 
this is the virtue of the virtuously indignant it is virtue that is not content merely to be virtuous to the glory of god it has no patience with the simple beauty and goodness of the saints virtue in the eyes of the virtuously indignant is hardly worthy to be called virtue unless it goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom it may devour virtue according to this view is a detective inquisitor and flagellator of the vices especially of the vices that are so unpopular that the mob may be easily persuaded to attack them one of the chief differences between the two kinds of virtue i fancy is that while true virtue regards the mob spirit as an enemy similar virtue if we may adopt the shakespearean phrase looks to the mob as its cousin and its ally to be virtuous in the latter sense is obviously as easy as hunting rats or cats virtue of this kind is simply the eternal huntsman in man's breast with eyes aglint for a victim it is mr murdstone's virtue the persecutor's virtue it is the virtue that warms the bosom of every man who is more furious with his neighbor's sins than with his own if virtue is merely an inflammation against our neighbor's sins what man on earth is so mean as to be incapable of it to be virtuous in this fashion is as easy as lying those who abstain from it do so not out of lack of heart but from choice we have read of the popularity of the ducking stool in former days for women taken in adultery savage mobs may have thought that by putting their hearts into this amusement they were making up to virtue for the long years of neglect to which as individuals they had subjected her they might not have been virtue's lovers but at least they could be virtue's bullies after all virtue itself is no bad sport when chasing kicking thumping and yelling are made the chief part of the game sending dogs coursing after a hare is nothing to it man's enjoyment of the chase never rises to the finest point of ecstasy save when his victim is a human being man's inhumanity to man says the poet makes countless thousands mourn but think also of the countless thousands that it makes rejoice we should always remember that the crucifixion was an exceedingly popular event and in no quarter more so than among the virtuously indignant it would probably never have taken place had it not been for the close alliance between the virtuously indignant and the mob to be fair to the virtuously indignant in the mob they do not insist beyond reason that their victim shall be a bad man good hunting may be had even among the saints and who does not enjoy the spectacle of a citizen distinguished mainly for his unblemished character being dragged down into the dust we have no reason to believe that the people who were burned during the inquisition were worse than their neighbors yet the mob we are told used to gather enthusiastically and dance round the flames the destructive instincts of the mob are such that in certain moods it is ready to destroy any kind of man just as the destructive instincts of a puppy are such that in certain moods it is ready to destroy any sort of book whether smiles self-help or mademoiselle du maupin is a matter of perfect indifference the virtuously indignant maintain their power by constantly inciting and feeding this appetite for destruction hence when we feel virtuously indignant we would do well to inquire of ourselves if that is the limit and z of our virtue have we no sins of our own to amend that we have all this time for barking and biting at the vices of our neighbours and if we must attack the sins of our fellows would it not be the more heroic course to begin with those we are most tempted by instead of those to which we have no mind do not let the drunkard feel virtuous because he is able with an undivided heart to denounce simony and do not let the forger who happens to be a teetotaler because of the weakness of his stomach be too virtuously indignant at the red-nosed patron of the four ale bar any of us can achieve virtue if by virtue we merely mean the avoidance of the vices that do not attract us 
most of us can boast that we have never been cruel to a hippopotamus or had dealings with a succubus or taken a bribe of a million pounds to betray a friend on these points we can look forward with perfect confidence to the scrutiny of the day of judgment i fear however the recording angel is likely to devote such little space as he can afford to each of us to the vices we have rather than to the vices we have not even charles peace would have been acquitted if he had been accused of brawling in church instead of murder hence it is to be hoped that passengers in railway trains will not remain content with gloating down upon the unappetizing sins of which the forty seven thousand are accused by mr pemberton billing steep and perilous is the ascent of virtue and the british public may well be grateful to mr billing and mr bottomley if they help it with voice or outstretched hand to climb to the snowy summits so far as can be seen however all that mr billing and mr bottomley do is to interrupt the british public in its upward climb and orate to it on the monstrous vices of the cities of the plain this may be an agreeable diversion for weary men but it obviously involves the neglect of virtue not the pursuit of it most people imagine that to pursue vice is to pursue virtue but the wisdom of the ages tells us that the only thing to do to vice is to fly from it lot's wife was a lady who looked round once too often to see what was happening to the forty seven thousand let mr billing and mr bottomley beware their interest in the cities of the plain will turn them into pillars of salt a thousand years before it turns them into pillars of society as for virtue then how is it to be achieved merely by blackening the rest of the world we cannot hope to make ourselves white modern writers tell us that we cannot make ourselves white even by blackening ourselves they denounce the sense of sin as a sin and tell us that there is nothing of which we should repent except repentance we need not stay to discuss this point we know well enough that so long as the human intellect to leave the human conscience out of the question survives men will be burdened with the sense of imperfection and think enviously of the nobility of epatimondus or julius caesar or st francis of assisi for we have to count even julius caesar among the virtuous though the scandalmongers would not have it so his vices may have made him bald and brought about his assassination but he had the heroic virtues courage and generosity and freedom from vindictiveness when we read how he wept at the death of his great enemy and how from the man who brought him pompey's head he turned away with loathing as from an assassin we bow before the nobility of his character and realize that he was something more than a stern man and an adulterer pompey too had this gift of virtue this capacity for turning away from foul means of besting his enemies when he had captured perpina in spain the latter offered him a magnificent story of a plot the knowledge of which would have put the lives of many leading romans in his power perpina who had come into possession of the papers of sartorius offered says plutarch to produce letters from the chief men of rome who had desired to subvert the existing order and change the form of government and had therefore invited sertorius into italy pompey therefore fearing that this might stir up greater wars than those now ended put perpina to death and burned the letters without even reading them it was hard on perpina but in burning the letters at least pompey gave us an example of virtue it is plutarch's feeling for the beauty of such noble actions that has made his biographies a primer of virtue for all time none of his heroes are primarily good men there is scarcely one of them who could have been canonized by any church they have enough of the weaknesses of flesh and blood to satisfy even the most exacting novelist of these days on the other hand they nearly all had that capacity for grandeur of conduct which distinguishes the noble man from the base 
plutarch never pretends that mean and filthy motives and generous motives do not jostle one another strangely in the same breast but his portraits of great men give us the feeling that we are in presence of men redeemed by their virtues rather than utterly destroyed by their vices suetonius on the other hand is the historian of the forty seven thousand his book may be recommended as scandal-mongering hardly as an aid to virtue here we have servants evidence of roman history the plots and the secret vices suetonius fortunately has the grace not to write as though in narrating his story of vice he were performing a virtuous act if we are to have stories of fashionable sinners let us at least have them naked and not dressed up in the language of outraged virtue scandal is sufficiently entertaining by itself there is no need to lace it with self-righteousness end of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of the Pleasures of Ignorance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind. Chapter Twelve. June. There is always a cuckoo that stays out later than the other cuckoos two goldfinches came and sang in the cattle-paw tree in the garden it is difficult to decide with which sentence to begin there are so many pleasures the goldfinches have not come back again however they and the faint blue flowers of the cattle-paw turned a sinister growth for an interval into a small paradise of colour and song then the flowers fell they had no more life than snow in may coming in as they did at the end of years of barrenness they astonished one like the blossoming of the rose of sharon but now the bough is dark and sinister and melancholy again sparrows squabble over their love affairs in it the cuckoo that stays out later than the other cuckoos is the triumphant survivor not that there is much to be said even for him as a model of continuance his note will soon change he will become hoarse and only half articulate he will cease to be the flying echo of the mystery of skies and wood at dawn and in the still evening the disreputable bat whose little wings flutter half visibly like waves of heat rising above a stove will outlast him there is no getting beyond the old image of things in general as a stream that disappears the flowers and the birds come in tides that sweep over the world and in a moment are lost like a broken wave the lilacs fill with purple laburnum followed and in a few days all the gold ebbed and nothing was left but a drift of withered blossoms on the ground then came the acacia flowers white as the morning among the cool green plumage of the tree and now they too have been turned into dirtiness and deserted foam and in the hedges change has been as swift as merciless change so imperceptible in what it is doing so manifest in what it has done the white blossoms of the sloe gave place to the foam of the hawthorn and the flat clusters of the wayfaring tree now in its turn has come the flood of the elder flowers a flood of commonness and june on the roads would hardly be beautiful were it not for the roses that settle delicate and fleeting as butterflies on the long and crooked briars perhaps one has not the right to say of any flower or any bird that it is not beautiful even elder flowers seen at a distance can give cheerfulness to a roadside but if we have to pick and choose among flowers there are many who will give the lowest prize to the flowers that have been compared to umbrellas elder flowers cow's parsley hemlock and the rest these are the plebeians of the hedges and ditches they have the air of something useful one would imagine they were intended to be cooked and eaten in cheap restaurants we experience no lifting of the heart at the sight of them we should be surprised to hear the abrupt ecstasy of a wren issuing from among their leaves and yet it is hardly a week since walking in a sussex lane i saw a long procession of cow's parsley on the top of a high bank silhouetted against the twilight sky 
there seemed never to have been more exquisite flowers they had captured the silver of evening as in a net there are many flowers that seem ugly to an indifferent eye even the red valerian that sprouts so boldly in bushes of coral from the top of the wall is regarded by some people as a weed and an impudent intruder for myself i love the spectacle of stone walls breaking out into flower with red valerian and ivy-leaved toad flax the country people have greeted these flowers with comic and friendly names valerian they call drunken sailor and the ivy-leaved toad flax that blossoms in a thousand tiny blue butterflies from the stones has so prolific it is been given the nickname of mother of thousands i doubt however whether the country people have as many fanciful names for the flowers as they are represented as having in the books when mr w h hudson first came on winter heliotrope in cornwall and was attracted by its meadow sweet smell at a season when there were few other flowers he was told by a countryman that it was called simply weed countrymen if they are asked the same of a flower will often say that they do not know but that they call it so-and-so a small boy who was gathering green stuffs for his rabbits came up and walked beside me the other day and on being shown some goose-grass and asked what name he knew it by said i don't know its name we call it cleavers in my childhood i never heard it called by any other name than robin run the hedge and under that name alone am i attracted by it cleavers is too reminiscent of a butcher's yard or of some dull tool goosegrass at least fills the imagination with the picture of a bird but robin run the hedge is better for it is an image of wild adventure it will be a pity if the tradition of picturesque names for flowers is allowed to die the kidney vetch a long yellow claw of a flower that looks withered even at birth may not deserve a prettier name but at least it is possible to give it an ugly name with more interesting associations staunch is an older name that reminds us that the flower was a few generations ago used to staunch wounds the other name it is suggested had its origin in the supposed excellence of the plant in curing diseases of the kidney but there seem to be no grounds for believing this there are unfortunately some beautiful flowers for which no beautiful or even expressive name has ever been invented who is there who coming on the blue scabious on a hill near the sea is not conscious of the gross failure of the human race in never having found anything but this name out of a dustbin for one of the most charming of flowers matthew arnold appalled by some of the names of human beings that still flourished in the days of victoria and may for all i know be flourishing to-day once hoped to turn us into hellenists by declaring that there was no rag on the illusus was there no scabious on the illusus either i wonder were i a flower of the field i should prefer to be called nosebleed or sow thistle on the whole however the plants have little to complain of in the matter of names the milkwort that has been scattering its fine delicate colors among the short grasses of the bare hills deserves its beautiful name grace of god we think of it as the sprigging of a divine mantle cast over the june world the greater plantain that after the recent rain has come out on the hills with a ruff of purple feathers round its brown cone neither deserves nor possesses a name connoting sacredness it is interesting mainly as a plant that somehow became associated with the voyages and travels of english men and is known in america as english man's foot because wherever the english man goes the plant follows him the riot of the spring flowers is already passing however as we walk along the path through the corn we find the wild mustard that a few weeks ago made a steep field blaze like a precinct of the sun already withering into a mass of green pods 
and the hay in the valley has been cut down with all its crimson clover the smell of the tossed hay as we pass sends back the memory into an older world how is it that sweet smells do not please us so much for what they are as for the things of which they remind us at the smell of hay newly stacked we cease to be our present age we are in a world as distant as that of theocritus there is no ambition in it no tears or taxes no men and women pretending nothing that is not happy every scent is sweet every sound is a laugh or a bird song every man and woman and animal we behold is more interesting than if they had come out of a noah's ark smell has been described as the most sensual of the senses it may be so but it is surely also the sense that is most closely related to the memory old landscapes old happinesses old gardens old people come to life again at times almost unbearably so with the smell of wallflower or hay or the sea it may be however that this is not a universal experience some of us no doubt live more in our memories than others it is our doom even we however are sensualists of the open air and the spectacle of the wind foaming among the leaves of the oak and elm can easily make us forget all but the present the blue hills in the distance when rain is about the grey arras of wet that advances over the plain the white throat that sings or rather scolds above the hedge as he dances on the wing the tree pipit or is it another bird that sinks down to the juniper tip through a honey of music a rough sea seen in the distance half shine half scowl any of these things may easily cut us off from history and from hope and immure us in the present hour or may they or do these things too not leave us homesick discontented gloomy gloomy if it is only because we are not nearly so gloomy as we ought to be end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the pleasures of ignorance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by eva davis the pleasures of ignorance by robert lind on feeling gay gaiety has come back at least to parts of london there never were greater crowds of people eating with bottles at their sides in public places on the whole however there has been little downheartedness at restaurants during the past four and a half years even while the housewife in the red brick street was wasting her mornings in the patient vigil of the queue only to find at the end of it that there was no butter no lard no tea no jam no golden syrup no prunes no potatoes no currants no olive oil or whatever it might be she wanted most the restaurants never shut their doors as the grocers shops and the confectioners sometimes did when rationing came one could eat the greater part of the week's beef allowance at a single meal in the home but in a restaurant one could get four excellent meat meals in some restaurants even eight excellent meals in return for a week's coupons there were no doubt parts of the country in which the housewife was hardly more restricted than the diner out in restaurants travellers came back from places in dorsetshire gloucestershire and scotland as from ireland with gorgeous narratives of areas in which the king's writ did not run so far as coupons were concerned and beef was free if only you paid for it but in london and especially in the home counties there was no such reign of liberty the housewife went shopping as it were on ticket of leave and even the sleepiest suburbans began to realize that the arrival of our daily bread 
is a daily miracle instead of the commonplace it once seemed to be had dr faustus come back to life a modern lady would have invoked the aid of his magic for some food less romantic than grapes out of season she would have been content with a tin of golden syrup as for butter it is surprising that no one wrote a sonnet to butter during the war i have seen eyes positively moisten with love at the sight of a small dish of it even from the restaurants it seemed to vanish for a time and some of them are still doing their best to help one to deceive oneself with a curl of what is called butter substitute the restaurant however seems to be better supplied than the home with the three great aids to gaiety wine jam and currants i confess i have never been able to understand why currants should be generally regarded as one of the necessary ingredients of perfect pleasure but they unquestionably are the child on a holiday will eat a bun with only three currants in it with three times more pleasure than he will eat a frankly plain bun a suet pudding without currants or raisins is prison fare barren to the eye and cheerless let but an infrequent currant or raisin peep from the mass and it is a pudding for a birthday so universal is the passion for currants as an aid to pleasure that during the past three weeks the only matter that rivalled in general interest the question whether the kaiser was to be hanged was the question whether we should have currants before christmas so profound is the disappointment of the public at the non-arrival of the currents that explanations have been put in the papers calling on us to practice the sublime virtue of self-sacrifice happy in the knowledge that all the currents are needed for invalid soldiers but if the currents are needed for soldiers how comes it that we sometimes find them in the puddings in restaurants those who are concerned for the preservation of home life in this country cannot but be perturbed by the way in which this matter of currents the scales have been weighted in favor of the restaurant and against the home as for jam the diner in the restaurant rejoices in jam roll while the child in the home labors its way through tapioca pudding is it any wonder if as the pessimists believe the english home decays whether as a result of the jam roll or the rare currants in the puddings it has been unusually difficult to get a table at some of the restaurants since the signing of the armistice no doubt the signing of the armistice itself had something to do with it christian men whenever anything epoch-making happens must have something to eat marriage the return of a conquering hero the visit of a great statesman the birth of christ we find in all these things a reason for calling on the cooks to do their damnedest even the dyspeptic forgets his doctor's orders in the general excitement and chases oysters down the narrow stairway of his throat with thick soup follow thick soup with lobster and lobster with turkey and turkey with a savory and the savory with peshmelba and at the end of it will not reject cheese and a banana all of this accompanied with streams of liquid in the form of wine coffee and brandy i have often wondered why a man should feel gay doing violence to his entrails in this fashion i have noticed again and again that he loses a little of his gaiety if the dinner is served slowly enough to give him time to think the gay meal like the farce must be enacted quickly the very spectacle of waiters hurrying to and fro with an air of peril to the dishes quickens the fancy and the gastric juices flow to an antipistic measure who does not know what it is to sit through a slow meal and digest it in spondees one is given time between the courses to turn philosopher to meditate becoming a hermit and dining on a bowl of rice in a cave nothing can prevent one from there and then coming to a decision on the matter 
save a waiter with the eye of a psychoanalyst ready to rush forward at the first sadness of an eyelid and tempt one either with a new dish or with a glass refilled stay me with flagons comfort me with apples it is a universal cry our desire is for the banqueting house perhaps it is not so much that we feel gay as that we are afraid of feeling gloomy we have no force within us that will enable us to laugh over lettuce and become wits on water there must be an element of riot in our eating and drinking if we are to drive dull care away that is the defence of cakes and ale cakes no doubt are not what they used to be and ale is even less so but human beings are symbolists and if you give them something that looks like cakes and something that looks like beer it is surprising how content they will be our eating and drinking is but a game and we deceive ourselves at table like children among their toys even the vegetarian lies his food into grandeur not its own there is a vegetarian restaurant in london in which one of the dishes on the bill of fare bears the name like chicken splendide mendax one of the most amazing features in the appearance of london at the present time is surely the absence of the signs of widespread mourning the windows of the shops are full of all the colours of the parrot the hats are as bright as a scrapbook the confectioner shops are making a desperate effort to look as if nothing had happened the death of a single monarch would have darkened christmas in regent street more effectually than the million mornings of the war it is though we were eager to conceal from ourselves the news of this terrible disaster after all to judge by the crowds in the streets most people still remain alive we have sworn we will never forget those others but one has only to read some of the election speeches to see that with many of us our own greed and vindictiveness are already ousting the ideals for which hundreds of thousands of men gave up their lives can it be that we are feeling gay not only because we have escaped from the disasters of the war but because we are escaping from the ideals of the war it is as though we had returned from the barren snows of the mountain tops to the cosy plenty of the valleys we are glad to exchange the stars as companions for the nearer illuminations of the streets the familiar world is coming back and civilian youths have begun once more to sing musical choruses on the way home on the tops of buses and dally and dally then dilly but you can't trust a special like an old-time copper when you can't find your way home peace had returned without question when nonsense of this venerable kind sped into the air from the roof of a late bus well we have always wanted the world to be as usual we were angry with the germans for plunging us into the unusualness of war and we feel scarcely more friendly to those who would plunge us into the unusualness of utopia we feel at home among neither horrors nor ideals we are glad at the prospect of having the old world back rather than at having to make a new world lord birkenhead i observe declares that it would be an awful thing if the war had left us unchanged but we look in vain for signs of any deep change even in the speeches of lord birkenhead one noticeable change the war has unquestionably made more women smoke in the restaurants than formerly sanguine people declare that other changes are impending but other people equally sanguine are doing their best to prevent this the human race is gradually feeling its way back to its traditional division into those who desire a change and those who desire to keep things as they are 
the christmas festival appeals to both equally it is at once an old custom and the prophecy of a new earth on such a day one can rejoice even without currents or the league of nations the world is a good place let us eat drink and be merry end of chapter thirteen So it dilly and dally and dally and dilly, but you can't trust a special like an old time copper when you can't find your way out. So it dilly and dally and dally and dilly. But you can't trust a special like an old time copper when you can't find your way out. So it dilly and dally and dally and dilly, but you can't trust a special like an old time copper when you can't find your way out. Chapter fourteen of the Pleasures of Ignorance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brianna. The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind. Chapter 14. In the Train. It is said that traveling by train is to be made still more uncomfortable. I doubt if there is a man of sufficient genius in the government to accomplish this. Are not the trains already merely elongated buses without the racing instincts of the bus? Have they not already learned to crawl past mile after mile of backyard and back garden at such a snail's pace that we have come to know, like an old friend, every disreputable garment hung out on the clothes line of a score of suburbs? Do they not stand still at the most unreasonable places with the obstinacy of a ass? Stations, the names of which used to be an indistinguishable blur, as we swept past them as on a swallow's swing, have now become a part of the known world, and have as much attention paid to them as though they were Paris or Vienna. Equality has not yet been established among men, but it has been established among stations. There never was such a democracy of frightfulness. We seldom see a station which has about it the air of permanence. 
There are, I believe, good historical reasons why there are no Tudor stations or Queen Anne stations to be found in the country. Still, I know of no reason why so many stations should look as though they had been built hurriedly to serve the needs of a month, like a travelling show in a piece of waste ground. Not that the railway station has any of the gutty detail of the travelling show. It resembles it only in its dusty and haphazard setting. It is more like a builder's or a tombstone maker's yard. The very letters in which the name of the station is printed are often of a deliberate ugliness. No newspaper would tolerate letters of such an ugliness in its headlines. They stare at one vacuously, joylessly. It is said that the village of Amberley is known to the natives as Amberley, God help us. How many stations look at us from their nameplates with that God help us air? What I should like to see would be a nameplate that would seem to announce to us in passing. Glasgow, thank God, or whatever the name of the station may be. I have never yet discovered a Mary station. Here and there, a station master has done his best to make the place attractive by planting geraniums in the form of letters to spell the name of the place on a neighboring embankment. But these things remind one of the flowers on a grave, and the people who walk up and down the platform, their noses cold in the wind, are hardly more cheerful than undertaker's men. Even the porters in their green trousers, who roll the milk cans along the platform to the luggage van, with an energy and a clatter that would satisfy the ambition of any healthy child, do not look merry. There was one cheerful porter who used to welcome you like a host, and make a jest as he clipped your railway ticket, just to lighten your load, sir. But the government had him removed and put to mind gates at a crossing, where he would not be able to speak to to the passengers. As a rule, however, nobody looks as if he liked being in a railway station or would stop there if he could go anywhere else. I trust the Ministry of Reconstruction will see to it that the railway stations of the country are rebuilt and vivified. One does not really wish to stop at any station at all except one's own station but if one has to do so let the stations be made more amusing unfortunately it is not only the frequent stops that have made railway travelling almost ideally uncomfortable the government seems also to have hired a staff of workers to impregnate the seats of the carriages with dust and to scatter all the dust that can be spared in these exiguous days on the floors. They have also a gang of old and wheezy gentlemen who travel up and down the line all day, shutting the windows. This work is sometimes deputed to women. They are forbidden to say, may I, or do you mind? or to make use of any civil expression that might mollify the traveller sitting by the window. It is part of their instructions to reach past him with an air of independence, and to have the window shut, and the book that he is reading knocked out of his hand before he has time to see what has happened. Some day someone will write a book about the alteration of English manners that took place during the Great War. 
I believe the alteration is largely due to these government hirelings whose duty is to make railway travel a burden and never to say please or thank you. Even now, however, there are compensations. In the morning, the shadows are long, and as one rattles north among the water meadows, the flying plumes of the engine leave a procession of melting silhouettes on the fields to the west. Rooks oar their way towards their homes with long twigs in their beaks. Horses go through the last days of their kingship, dragging ploughs and harrows over the fields with a slow and monotonous tread. Here a hill has been ploughed into a sea of little brown waves. Further on, a meadow is a red bright with the green of winter sown corn. The country has never been so labored before. Chalk and sand and brown earth and red are all being turned up and broken and bathed in the sun and wind. Adam has begun to delve again. There is the urgency of life in the fields long idle. It is not that the fields have become populous. One sees many labored fields, but little labor. The occasional plowed horse, however, brings strength into stillness. How noble a figure of energy he makes! As for us, who sit in the railway train, we do not look at him much. We are all either reading papers or talking. Two old men, bearded and greasy-coated, tramps of bygone era, sit opposite it one another and neither read nor talk. One of them is bleared-eyed and coughs and has an unclean moustache. All his friends ever says to him is, clean your nose, making an impatient gesture. A young man in a bowler hat and spectacles, who smokes a pipe in inward drum lips, discusses the labor situation with some acquaintances. They would be all right, he explains, if it wasn't for the labor leaders. You know what a labor leader is? He is a chap that never did an honest day's work in his life. He finds it pays better to jaw than to work, and I don't blame him. After all, it's human nature. Every man's out to do the best for himself, isn't he? Your nose, blow your nose, mumbled the tramp across the carriage. Take Australia, continues the young man. They've had labor governments in Australia. What good did they do for the working man? Did they satisfy him? Why, there were more strikes in Australia under the labor government than there ever had been before. Did you hear that, Johnny? I heard another voice saying, A tame rabbit was sold Saturday in Guildford Market for twelve and six pence. How did they know it was a tame one? Ah, now you're asking. A man looked up from the morning post with interest in his face. Why, he said, is a tame rabbit considered to be better eating than a wild one? It was explained to him that wild rabbits were often kept for a long time after they were killed and were therefore regarded as more dangerous. Otherwise, the tame rabbit had no point of superiority. What do you say, Johnny? Johnny had a fat face and no eyelashes, and wore a muffler instead of a collar. I say, give me a wide one. The man with the morning post went on to talk about rabbits and the price at which he had sold them. At intervals, during everything he said, Johnny kept nodding 
and saying with a smile of relish, Give me a wild one. He said it even when the talk had drifted altogether away from rabbits. He went on repeating it to himself in lower tones, as though at last he had found a thought that suited him. Municipalization means jobbery, said the young man with bowler hat. Look at the county council tramways. Give me a wild one, said Johnny, in a dreamy whisper. I say, give me a wild one. Why, it stands to reason, if you have a friend and you see a chance of showing him into a job at the public expense, you do it, won't you? said the young man addressing the reader of the morning post who merely cleared his throat nervously in answer it's human nature said the young man give me a white one whispered johnny i'm afraid there's going to be trouble in ireland the man with the morning post turned the subject the young man was ready for him there will always be trouble in ireland he said with what the novelists describe as a curl of his lips, so long as Ireland exists. The tramp continued to mumble about the condition of his friend's nose. Johnny relapsed into silence, and the young man made the man with the morning post tremble by a horrible picture of what the country would be like under a labor government. It would be all U.P., he said firmly, all up. Who would travel in such days if he could possibly avoid it? End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of the Pleasures of Ignorance – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by ZZ Turner. The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind. Chapter 15 The Most Curious Animal. Curiosity is the first of the sins. On the day on which Eve gave way to her curiosity, man broke off his communion with the angels and allied himself with the beasts. Today, we usually applaud curiosity. We think of it as the alternative to stagnation. The tradition of mankind, however, is against us. The fables never pretend that curiosity is anything but an evil. Literature is full of tales of forbidden rooms that cannot be peeped into without disaster. Fatima in Bluebeard escapes punishment, but her escape is narrow enough to leave her a warning to the nursery. A version of the Pandora legend imputes the state of mankind to the curiosity of one disastrous fool who raised the lid of the sacred box, with the result that the blessings intended for our race escaped and flew away. We have cursed the inquisitive person through the centuries. We have instinctively hated him to the point of persecution. The curious among mankind have gone about their business at peril of their lives. It is probable that Athens was a city as much given to curiosity as any city has ever been. And yet, the Athenians put Socrates to death on account of his curiosity. He was accused of speculating about the heavens above and inquiring into the earth beneath, as well as of corrupting the youth and making the worse appear the better reason. History may be read as the story of the magnificent rearguard action fought during several thousand years by dogma against curiosity. Dogma is always in the majority and is therefore detestable, but it is also always beaten and is therefore admirable. It rallies its forces afresh on some new field in every generation. 
it fights with its back to the sunrise under a banner of darkness but even when we abominate it most we cannot but marvel at its endurance the odd thing is that man clings to dogma from a sense of safety he can hardly help feeling that he was never so safe as he is in the present in possession of this little patch his fathers have bequeathed to him he felt quite safe without printed books without chloroform without flying machines he mocked at icarus as the last word in human folly we say nowadays as safe as the bank of england but he felt safer without the bank of england we are told that when the bank was founded in sixteen ninety four its institution was warmly opposed by all the dogmatic believers in things as they were but it is against curiosity about knowledge that men have fought most stubbornly galileo was forbidden to be curious about the moon one of the most difficult things to establish is our right to be curious about facts the dogmatists offer to provide us with all the facts a reasonable man can desire if we persist in believing that there is a world of facts yet undiscovered and that it is our duty to set out in quest of it in the eyes of the dogmatists we are scorned as heretics and charlatans even at the present day when the orthodoxies sit on shaky thrones dogma still opposes itself to curiosity at many points a great deal of the popular dislike of psychical research is due to hatred of curiosity in a new direction people who admit the existence of a world of the dead commonly feel that none the less it ought to be taboo to the too curious intellect of man they feel there is something uncanny about spirits that makes it unsafe to approach them with an inquisitive mind. I am not concerned either to attack or defend spiritualism. I merely suggest that a rational attack on spiritualism must be based on the insufficiency of the evidence put forward in its behalf, not on the ground that the curiosity which goes in search of such evidence is in itself wicked it is odd to see how men who take sides with dogma give themselves the airs of men who live for duty while they regard the more curious among their fellows as licentious trifling irreverent and self-indulgent the truth is there is no greater luxury than dogma it puts an eminence under the most stupid at the same time i am not going to deny the pleasures of curiosity we have only to see a cat looking up the chimney or examining the nooks of a box room or looking over the edge of a trunk to see what is inside in order to realize that this is a vice if it is a vice which we inherit from the animals we find a comparable curiosity in children and other simple creatures servants will rummage through drawer after drawer of old dull letters out of idle curiosity there are men who declare that no woman could be trusted not to read a letter we persuade ourselves that man is a higher animal above curiosity and a slave to his sense of honor but man too likes to spy upon his neighbors when he is not indifferent to them no scrupulous person of either sex would read another person's letter surreptitiously but that is not to say that we do not want to know what is in the letter we can hardly see a parcel lying unopened in the hall without speculating on what it contains we should always feel happier if the owner of the parcel indulged us to the point of opening it in our presence i know a man whose curiosity extends so far as to set him uncorking any medicine bottles he sees in a friend's house, sniffing at them, and even sipping them, to see what they taste like. Oh, I have had that one, he says, as he lingers over the bitter flavor of strychnine. Let me see, he reflects as he sips another bottle, there's nux vomica in that. 
Half the interesting books of the world were written by men who had just this sipping kind of curiosity. Curiosity was the chief pleasure of Montaigne and of Boswell. We cannot read an early book of science without finding signs of the pleasure of curiosity in its pages. Theophrastus, we may be sure, was a happy man when he wrote, However, there is one question which applies to all perfumes, namely, why it is that they appear to be sweetest when they come from the wrist, so that perfumers apply the scent to this part. To be curious about such matters would keep many a man entertained for an evening. Some people are so much in love with their curiosity that they object even to having it satisfied too quickly with an obvious explanation. We have an instance of this and a pleasant anecdote about Democritus which Montaigne borrowed from Plutarch. Montaigne, who substitutes figs for cucumbers in the story, relates, Democritus, having eaten figs at his table that tasted of honey, fell presently to consider within himself whence they should derive this unusual sweetness, and to be satisfied in it was about to rise from the table to see the place whence the figs had been gathered, which his maid observing, and having understood the cause, she smilingly told him that he need not trouble himself about that, for she had put them into a vessel in which there had been honey. He was vexed that she had thus deprived him of the occasion of this inquisition, and robbed his curiosity of matter to work upon. Go thy way, said he, thou hast done me wrong, but for all that I will seek out the cause as if it were natural, and would willingly have found out some true reason for a false and imaginary effect. The novel reader who becomes furious with someone for letting him into the secret of the end of the story is of the same mind as Democritus. Go thy way, he says in effect, thou hast done me wrong. The child protests in the same way to a too informative elder, you weren't to tell me. He would like to wander in the garden paths of curiosity. He has no wish to be let off hurriedly into the schoolroom of knowledge. He instinctively loves to guess. He loves at least to guess at one moment and be told the next. The greater part of human curiosity has little to be said for it or against it as a child's whim. It is an affair of the senses and an extraordinarily innocent one. It is a vanity of the eye or ear. It is another form of the hatred of being left out. So many human beings do not like to miss things. We saw during Saturday's aeroplane raid how far men and women will go rather than miss things. Thousands of Londoners stood in the streets and at their windows and gazed at what seemed to be the approach of one of the plagues of Egypt. No plague of locusts ever came out of the sky with the greater air of the will to destruction. It was as though the eastern sky were hung with these monstrous insects leisurely hovering over a people they meant to destroy. They had the cupidity of hawks at one moment, at another they had the innocence of a school of little fishes. Shell smoke opened out among them like a sponge thrown into the water. It swelled into larger clouds, monstrous in shape, as the things doctors preserve in bottles. But the plague did not rest. One saw a little black aeroplane hurry across them, a mere water beetle of a thing, and one wondered if a collision would send one of them to earth with broken wings but one did not really know whether this was the maneuver of an enemy or the daring of a friend. There was never a more astonishing spectacle. A desperate battle in the air would have been less of a surprise, but that there should have been nobody to interfere with them. Yes, it was certainly a curious sight, and London was justified in putting its head out of its house like a tortoise under its shell 
till the bombs began to fall. Still, the more often they come, the less curious we shall be about them. A few years ago, we gladly paid five shillings for the pleasure of seeing an aeroplane float round a big field. There is a limit, however, to our curiosity even about German aeroplanes. Speaking for myself, I may say my curiosity is satisfied. I do not care if they never come again. End of chapter 15 The Most Curious Animal Chapter 16 of The Pleasures of Ignorance This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind The Old Indifference It was an old belief of the poets and the common people that nature was sympathetic towards human beings at certain great crises comets flared and the sun was darkened at the death of a great man even the death of a friend was supposed to bow nature with despair and milton and lycidas mourned the friend he had lost in what nowadays seems to us the pasteboard hyperbole the willows and the hazel copse green shall now no more be seen fanning their joyous leaves to thy soft lays it may be contended that milton was here speaking not of nature but of his vision of nature and certainly one cannot help reading one's own joys and sorrows into the face of the earth when the lover in maud affirms a livelier emerald twinkled in the grass he states a fact he utters a truth of the eye and heart. The wonder of the world resides in him who sees it. The earth becomes a new place to a man who has fallen in love or who has just returned to it from the edge of the grave. It is though he saw the flowers as a stranger. Larks ascending make the planet a ball of music for him. He may well begin to lie about nature, for he has seen it for the first time. Experience is not long in warning him however that it is he and not the world that has changed he meets a funeral in the midsummer of his happiness and larks sing the same songs above the fields whether it is the lover or the mourner that goes by the continuity of nature is not broken either for our gladness or our grief mr hardy frequently introduces the mournful drip of rain into his picture of men and women unhappily mated but the rain is not at the beck and call of the unhappy the unhappy would still be unhappy though they were in a cherry orchard on the loveliest morning of the year the happy would still be happy though st swithin's day were streaming in floods down the window panes who does not know what it is to be happy watching the raindrops racing down the glass and hearing the gutter chattering like a hedge full of sparrows or tinkling like a bell who is there on the other hand who has not found and been perplexed to find the world going on its way in full song and bloom on a day that has seemed to him to darken all human experience burns's reproach to the indifferent earth has often been quoted as an expression of this realization that nature does not mind how can ye sing, ye little birds, and I say weary, full o' care? Nature, we discover, passes us and our sorrows by. We are of little account to the race of birds. We are of little account, for that matter, to the race of men. The end of Hamlet is not the end even of a kingdom. Fortinbras comes upon the scene, and life goes on our mornings are only interruptions the ranks of the procession close up and little is changed even the funeral of a king is as a rule less an occasion for grief than a spectacle for the curious the crowd may have filled the streets all night 
but they did not forget to bring their sandwiches and whiskey flask with them the theatres and the tea-shops and the public-houses will be as full as ever the next day and for the death of a great author not even the sweet-shops will be closed the funeral ceremonies over the dead body of herbert spencer drew a smaller crowd than would gather to see a dog that had been run over in the street we were never before so conscious of the indifference of nature to human tragedy as since the outbreak of the war here one would think was a tragedy that all but threatened to crack the globe one would imagine that the sides of nature must be in pain with it and the earth in peril of being hurled out of her accustomed path round the sun yet the sparrows in the surrey valleys have not heard of it and the seabirds know nothing of it save that occasionally they are bewildered to find a submarine rising from the waters instead of the porpoise for whose presence they had hoped it is said that the pheasants in a sussex wood awoke and screamed on sunday night during the barrage fire around london but this was egotism on part of the pheasants the pheasants of wiltshire did not have their sleep broken and so were not troubled about the sufferings of londoners wordsworth assured toussaint louverture there's not a breathing of the common air that will forget thee he exaggerated the common air is more perturbed in the year nineteen eighteen by the passing of a single gnat than by the memory of toussaint louverture on sunday i walked along a quiet hill road within thirty miles of london and it seemed for an hour or two as though one were as remote from the war as a man living a century hence the catkins and the hazels by the roadside were beautiful as falling rain they hung on the branches like notes of music the country children see them as lambs tails dangling in twos and threes in the gentle air they have been growing longer every day since christmas and the red tips of the female flowers have now begun to appear in the hedge there are still the remains of old man's beard that in one light looks like dirty wool but with the sun shining on it seems at a distance to be hawthorn in the full glory of blossom every now and then a crooked caterpillar of down is detached from it by the wind and sails off vaguely over a field a few weeks ago sparrows were singing choruses as they gorged themselves upon it but lately they have been scraping their beaks busily on the bark of trees as though they had found more satisfying dishes at the lower end of the road there is a glow of crimson among the sallows which have begun to festoon their straight rods with silver buds chaffinches are beginning to pipe more solitarily to each other in the tall elms a few weeks ago they fluttered everywhere in companies occupying now a hedge now a road and now a tree the naturalists tell us that these winter companies of chaffinches are usually composed of birds of one sex only the males consorting together for the time as in a boys school the chaffinch i think is the commonest bird in this part of the country it is so common that its loveliness has hardly been appreciated as it ought to be it is a little world of color like a small jay and nothing could be more beautiful than its flushed breast as it sits on the top of a tall tree in the sunset as for the jay it hurries away like a thief before one has time to see its coat of many colors the jay like the cuckoo is a bird with a guilty conscience the wood here is full of jays uttering their one monotonous shriek like the ripping of a skirt they scuttle among the trees at one's approach showing the white feather occasionally however they too will sit in a tree and allow the sun to flush their cinnamon-colored breast but we shall see hundreds of them before we see a single one in the crested and passive splendor of the jays in the picture books as a matter of fact nearly all the birds in the picture books are guesses and exaggerations the birds 
we discover before long, are a secret kingdom into which it is given to few to enter. The whole of nature, indeed, is curiously secretive. She does not tell much about herself, save to the importunate. Not many of us can speak her language, or have learned the password, to her cave of treasure. She thrust upon our notice a few birds, a few insects, a few animals, a few flowers. But for the most part, there is no finding her population without seeking for it. Hundreds of her flowers are hidden from the lazy eye, and we may pass a lifetime without seeing so common a bird as a tree creeper, or so common an animal as a shrew mouse. How seldom it is one sees even a rat. There are human beings who will never discover an early flower, however many miles they cover in their country walks. They take no pleasure in finding a wild strawberry flower in January, or a campion blossom in the first week in February. They are as indifferent to nature as nature is to them. The honeysuckle that breaks out with leaves as with green flames, the thrust of the leaves of the wild hyacinth under the trees, like the return of youth, the flowering of the elm, the young moon like a white bird with spread wings in the afternoon sky, the golden journey of Orion and his dog across the heavens by night. These things, they feel, are not interwoven with man's fate. They were before him, and they will be after him. Therefore, he cares more for his little brick house in the suburbs, which will at least be changed when he goes. I do not suggest that anyone consciously adopts a philosophy of this kind, but most of us are undoubtedly a little offended at some time in our lives when we realize that nature has so little regard for our passions and our tears. She is a consoler, but it is on her own terms. Matthew Arnold found the secret of life in becoming as resigned to obedience as the stars in the tide. Who knows but, if we do this, nature may be found to care after all. But she does not care in the way in which most of us want her to care. The religious discovered that long ago. They found that nature was guilty of neutrality in human affairs, if they did not go further and suspect her of enmity. It is only when philosophy has been added to religion that men have been able to reconcile without gloom the indifference of nature with the idea of the love of God. And even the religious and the philosophers are puzzled by the spectacle of the worm that rises on the garden path while the robin pecks at it, triumphant in his fatness and praising the fine weather. End of chapter 16 The Old Indifference Chapter 17 of The Pleasures of Ignorance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind. 17. Eggs and Easter Homily. Having decided to write on Easter, I took out a volume of the Encyclopedia Britannica in order to make up the subject of eggs, and the first entry under Egg that met my eye was Egg, Augustus Leopold, 1816 to 1863, English painter, was born on the 2nd of May, 1816, in London, where his father carried on business as a gunmaker. I wish I had known about Augustus five years ago. I should like to have celebrated the centenary of an egg somewhere else than in a London tea shop. Augustus Leopold Egg seems to have spent a life in keeping with his name. He was taught drawing by Mr. Sass, and in later years was a devotee of amateur theatricals, making a memorable appearance, as we should expect of an egg, in a play called Not So Bad As We Seem. He also appears to have devoted a great part of his life to painting bad eggs, if we may judge by the titles of his most famous pictures. Buckingham Rebuffed, Queen Elizabeth Discovers She Is No Longer Young, 
Peter the Great sees Catherine for the first time, and past and present, a triple picture of a faithless wife. She was a lady, no doubt, who could not submit to the marriage yoke. Anyhow, she had a great fall, and Augustus did his best to put her together again. Egg, the encyclopedia tells us finally, was rather below the middle height, with dark hair and a handsome, well-formed face. He seems to have been a man. Take him for all in all, we shall not look upon his like again. Even so, Augustus was not the only egg. He was certainly not the egg in search of which I opened the encyclopedia. The egg I was looking for was the Easter egg, and it seemed to be the only egg that was not mentioned. There were birds' eggs, and reptiles' eggs, and fishes' eggs, and mollusks' eggs, and crustaceans' eggs, and insects' eggs, and, and frogs' eggs, and Augustus' egg, and the eggs of the duck-billed platypus, which is the only mammal, except the spiny anteater, whose eggs are provided with a large store of yolk enclosed within a shell and extruded to undergo development apart from the maternal tissues. I do not know whether it is evidence of the irrelevance of the workings of the human mind or of our implacable greed of knowledge, but within five minutes I was deep in the subject of eggs in general and had forgotten all about the Easter variety. I found myself fascinated especially by the eggs of fishes. There are so many of them that one was impressed as one is on being told the population of London. It has been calculated says the writer of the article, that the number laid by the salmon is roughly about 1,000 to every pound weight of the fish, a 15-pound salmon laying 15,000 eggs. The sturgeon lays about 7 million, the herring 50,000, the turbot 14,311,000, the sole 134,000, the perch 280,000. This is the sort of sentence I always read over to myself several times. And when I come to the turbot, 14,311,000, I pause and try to picture to myself the man who counted them. How does one count 14,311,000? How long does it take? If one laid awake all night trying to put oneself to sleep by counting turbot's eggs instead of sheep, one would hardly have done more than make a fair start by the time the maid came in to draw the curtains and let in the sun on one's exhausted temples. A person like myself, ignorant of mathematics, could not easily count more than 10,000 in an hour. This would mean that, even if one lay in bed for 10 hours, which one never does except on one's birthday, one would have counted only 100,000 out of the 14,311,000 eggs by the time one had to get up for breakfast. That would leave 14,211,000 still to be counted. At this point, most of us, I think, would give it up in despair. After one horrible night's experience, we would jump into a hot bath muttering, Never again, never again, like a statesman who can't think of anything to say and send out for a quinine and iron tonic. Our friends, meeting us later in the day, would say with concern, Hello, you're looking rather cheap. What have you been doing? And when we answered bitterly, counting turbot's eggs, they would hurry off with an apprehensive look on their faces. The naturalist, it is clear, must be capable of a persistence that is beyond the reach of most of us. I calculate that if he were able to work for 14 hours a day, counting at the rate of 10,000 an hour, even then it would take him 122.214 days to count the eggs of a single turbot. After that, it would take a chartered accountant at least 122.214 days to check his figures. One can gather from this some idea of the enormous industry of men of science. For myself, I could more easily paint the Sistine Madonna or compose a Tenth Symphony than be content to loose myself into this universe of numbers. Pythagoras, I believe, discovered a sort of philosophy in numbers, but even he did not count beyond seven. After the fishes, the reptiles seem fairly modest creatures. The ordinary snake does not lay more than twenty or thirty eggs, 
and even the python is content to stop at a hundred. The crocodile, though a wicked animal, lays only twenty or thirty. The tortoise as few as two or four. And the turtle does not exceed two hundred. But I'm not really interested in eggs. Not at least in any eggs but bird's eggs. Or should not have been if I had not read the Encyclopedia Britannica. The sight of a fly's egg, if the fly lays an egg, fills me with disgust, and frog's eggs attract me only with the fascination of repulsion. What one likes about the birds is that they lay such pretty eggs. Even the duck lays a pretty egg. The duck is a plain bird, rather like a charwoman, but it lays an egg which is, or can be, as lovely as an opal. The flavor, I agree, is not Christian, but, like other eggs of which this can be said, it does for cooking. Hen's eggs are less attractive in color, but more varied. I have always thought it one of the chief miseries of being a man that, when boiled eggs are put on the table, one does not get first choice, and that all the little brown eggs are taken by women and children before one's own turn comes around. There is one sort of egg with a beautiful sunburnt look that always reminds me of the seaside that I have not tasted in a private house for above twenty years. To begin the day with such an egg would put one in a good temper for a couple of hours. But always one is fobbed off with a large white egg of demonstrative uncomeliness. It may taste all right, but it does not look all right. Food should appeal to the eye as well as to the palate as everyone recognizes when the blancmange that has not set is brought to the table. At the same time, there is one sort of white egg that is quite delightful to look at. I do not know its parent, but I think it is a black hen of the breed called Spanish. Not everything white in nature is beautiful. One dislikes instinctively white calves, white horses, white elephants, and white waistcoats. But the particular egg of which I speak is one of the beautiful white things, like snow, or a breaking wave, or teeth. So certain am I, however, that neither it nor the little brown one will ever come my way, while there is a woman or a child or a guest to prevent it, that when I am asked how I like my eggs to be done, I make it a point to say poached or fried gives me at least a chance of getting one of the sort of eggs I like by accident. As for poached eggs, I agree. There are nine ways of poaching eggs, and each of them is worse than the other. Still, there is one good thing about poached eggs. One is never disappointed. One accepts a poached egg like fate. There is no sitting on tenterhooks, watching and waiting and wondering, as there is in regard to boiled eggs. I admit that most of the difficulties associated with boiled eggs could be got over by the use of egg cozies, appurtenances of the breakfast table that stirred me to the very depths of delight when I first set my eyes on them as a child. It was at a mother's meeting where I was the only male present. Thousands of women sat round me, sewing and knitting things for a church bazaar. Much might be written about egg cozies. Much might be said for and much against. They would be effective, however, only if it were regarded as a point of honor not to look under the cozy before choosing the egg. And the sense of honor, they say, is a purely masculine attribute. Children never had it, and women have lost it. I do not know a single woman whom I would trust not to look under an egg cozy. Not, at least, unless she were forbidden eggs by the doctor. In that case, any egg would seem delicious, and she would seize the nearest, irrespective of class or color. This may not explain the connection between eggs and Easter. But then, neither does the Encyclopedia Britannica. I have looked up both the article on eggs and the article on Easter, and in neither of them can I find anything more relevant than such remarks as that the eggs of the lizard are always white or yellowish and generally soft-shelled, but the geckos and green lizards lay hard-shelled eggs. Or, Gregory O'Tours relates that in 577 there was a doubt about Easter. In order to learn something about Easter eggs, one has to turn to some such work as the Dictionary of Phrase and Fable, which tells us that 
the practice of presenting eggs to our friends at easter is magian or persian and bears allusion to the mundane egg for which ormuzd and ariman were to contend till the consummation of all things the advantage of reading titbits is that one gets to know hundreds of things like that the advantage of not reading titbits is that one is so ignorant of them that a piece of information of this sort is as fresh and unexpected as the morning's news every easter monday next easter i feel sure i shall look it up again i shall have forgotten all about the mundane egg even if ormuzd and ariman have not i shall be thinking more about my breakfast egg what a piece of work is a man and yet many profound things might be said about eggs mundane or otherwise i wish i could have thought of them End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the pleasures of ignorance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jim's vox four the pleasures of ignorance by robert lind chapter eighteen enter the spring one would imagine from the way in which some people are talking that this is an early spring i do not think it is the daffodils certainly came before the swallows dared but they came reluctantly and in less generous profusion than usual at least in one county as for the swallow it may have arrived by saturday but it has not arrived on the day on which i am writing about the middle of march says mr coward the first swallows arrive but i have met no one who has seen one even in the first week of april the sky seems empty without them this is no doubt an illusion there are plenty of rooks and pigeons and there are always starlings desperately hustling from the chimney pot across to the plum tree and back again but the starling is most interesting not when he's in the air but when he's at rest making queer noises in his effulgent tight-fitting clothes sometimes like a baby in a cradle sometimes like a girl trying to whistle always experimenting with sound rather than singing one looks forward to the swallows and martins and swifts because they really do live the life of the air the sky is their domain and no roof or tree or even telegraph wire till they arrive the air is an all but stagnant pool they transform it into a scene of whirlpools they do for the air what the hum of insects does for the garden they banish the stillness of winter and lead the year in the movements of a remembered dance spring however awakens gradually and does not plunge precipitately into an orgy first the home birds sing or rather redouble their singing for the wren and the robin hardly ever left off this i think must be an exceptional year for the chorus of wrens last year the lane that leads to the station was at this time a lane of chaffinches this year it's a lane of wrens last year the garden was a garden of thrushes this year it's a garden of wrens that is possibly an exaggeration but this little tetrazzini among the birds has never seemed to me to trill so dominantly and over so wide a rule as for the thrushes i do not know what's happened to them i heard plenty of them on the outskirts of london in february but here fifty miles from london it's as though they were an exterminated race whether gardeners or cats or some other epidemic is to blame the trees are silent of them even the blackbird is not too common here this year but then a country gardener regards a blackbird as a turk regards an armenian i wish thrushes and blackbirds could read 
so that one could put up a notice offering them sanctuary even at the expense of one's gooseberries and strawberries. Strange that a strawberry should appear more delightful to anyone than the song of a blackbird. I know, I may say, the feeling of helpless rage that wells up in the human breast at the sight of a blackbird stealing one's strawberries. Thank God I'm not impervious to moral indignation. If shouting, Stop, thief! could save the strawberries, my voice would be for saving them. But I do not believe in capital punishment for petty theft, and, anyhow, if I must lose either a song or a strawberry, I had rather lose the strawberry. The larks, luckily, take to the fields and do not trust themselves near either cats or gardeners. They do not always escape even in the fields, and the dead bodies of some of them are served in a pudding in a Fleet Street restaurant. But, on the whole, considering what a dangerous neighbour man is, they escape fairly lightly. There is a sort of live-and-let-live truce between them and the human race. The chaffinches, too, the greatest bird multitude there is, perhaps, after the house sparrows, are free enough to sing. They have been, during the past week, sailing out on short voyages from the tops of trees, like flycatchers, dancing in the air after their victims, and then returning to the spray. The greenfinch, that beautiful winged Mrs. Gummidge among birds, is also abundant, and slips down nervously every now and then among the groundsel in the unweeded garden. I confess the greenfinch has all my sympathy, but it rather bores me. What the deuce is it worrying about? There is no poetry in its lamentation, only a sort of habitual formula of a poor, lorn woman. If birds could read, I think I should add to the notices I put up a little board containing the words No bottles, no hawkers, no greenfinches. I should feel really sorry if they took any notice of my notice, but it might convey a hint to them that it would be good policy on their part to cheer up for at least five minutes in the day, and that, in any case, there is no need to say the same thing over and over again. Every bird, it's true, says the same thing over and over again, at any rate, more or less the same thing. Birds such as the robin and the thrush vary their song as the chaffinch and the willow wren do not. But even the robin and the thrush have a recognisable pattern. Fortunately, they are not always, like the greenfinch, thinking of the olden and thinking out loud. The goldfinches have begun to fly about the garden again with their little sequins of song, as someone has delightfully described their music. They have their eyes, I hope, on the pear tree, now as white as an alp, where they built and brought up a large family last year. The cornflowers in the flower border are already in bud, and I'm told that this is the temptation to which goldfinches most easily yield. I hope so, at any rate. I should have a garden blue with cornflowers, if I were sure that this would entice the seven colours of the goldfinch to make their home in it. Last Saturday, two lesser spotted woodpeckers invaded the garden. One always imagines a woodpecker as a bird of more substantial size, and it is surprising to see this little creature, patterned on the back like something made in the Omega workshop, no bigger than a sparrow, as it hastily visits apple and fig tree, and even Wygelia. As it climbed the Wygelia, indeed, a sparrow stooped down from an upper branch to study it, and then advanced in the direction of the woodpecker. The woodpecker lay back from the trunk of the tree, lying on its back in the air, as it were, and fluttering its wings while holding on with its claws, and seemed to invite the sparrow to come on. I don't think the sparrow had ever seen a woodpecker before. Its curiosity, rather than its wrath, was aroused by the strange spectacle. It did not want to hurt the foreigner, but only take a look at him. After having looked its fill, it moved off to a safer tree. Then the woodpecker, whose heart had no doubt been in its boots for the past five minutes, also loosed its hold on the bark 
and made off over the gate for a less exciting garden. Outside the garden, the spring began on Good Friday. It came in with the chiff-chaff. For three years in succession, I have heard the first chiff-chaff in exactly the same place, a clump of nut trees on the top of a high bank. At this time of year, too, before the leaves are out, it's easy to see it, and there are few more charming birds to watch. With its little beak as slender as a grass seed, and its body moving among the branches like a tiny shadow rather than flesh and bones, it pauses again and again in the midst of its eating to take an upward glance and utter its might of music, as monotonous as a Tibetan's praying wheel. Still lovelier is the willow wren that follows it. It's as though the chiff-chaff were the first sketch of a willow wren. The willow wren is the perfected work of art, with little shades of green added, and a voice that, small though its range is, is perhaps the most exquisite that will fill the air till the nightingale arrives. When I went out on Sunday morning, I prophesied that I would hear the first willow wren, and, though I heard only one in a hillside copse, where the cowslips are just getting their bells ready, the prophecy came true. Not that I'm much of a prophet. I don't know how often I've prophesied the arrival of the swallow, and indeed it is the surprises in nature, rather than the things that one foresees, that are the pleasantest, especially if one is easily surprised, as I am. Whoever ceases to be surprised, for instance, by the sight of a gold-crested wren, I heard its tiny pinpoint of voice last Sunday afternoon when I was walking past a plantation where the bullace was in flower and, on looking into the trees, saw the little thimble-sized creature making free with invisible insects, his beak is hardly big enough to eat a visible one, and performing acrobatics like a tit. One of the charms of the gold crest is that he does not look on a human being as a wild beast. The blackbird regards a man as a policeman. The greenfinch bolts for it if you so much as look at him. But the goldcrest feels as secure in your presence as if you were behind bars in a cage in the zoological gardens. One could probably make him jump if one went up to him and shouted suddenly in his ear, or even by making a violent gesture. But his first instinct is not to run. That, for a bird, is a considerable compliment. There can be nothing more distressing to a man of strictly honourable intentions than to have to creep about hedges furtively like a criminal in order to get a good look at a bird. Why he should want to look at birds at all is difficult to explain. I suppose it's a sort of disease, like going to the movies or doing exercises. All I know is that if you get it, you get it very badly. You would stop Shakespeare himself if he were reciting a new sonnet to you and bid him be quiet and look halfway up the elm where the nuthatch was beating away, up and down like a blacksmith, at a nut or something in a knob of the tree. St Paul might be reading out to you the first draft of his epistle to the Romans. You would quite unscrupulously interrupt him with a Hush, man! There's a tree creeper somewhere about. Listen, there he is. If you keep quiet, perhaps we'll be able to see him. I assure you, it's as bad as that. As for a man who takes out a noisy dog, or who whacks at loose stones with his stick on the road, you would regard him as a misbehaved and riotous person, and would not call him your friend. Everything has to be subordinated to the hope of catching sight of a hypothetical bird, which you've probably seen dozens of times already. Truly, there is no accounting for human vices. There is, however, at least this to be said in favour of bird-watching, that it is the pleasantest of the vices, that it is cheaper than golf, and does not harden the arteries like tea-drinking. And after all, if one is going to get excited at all, one may as well get excited about the colours and songs of birds as about most things. End of chapter 18